<laughs> we, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm Debbie Wolfson and I'm co-chair of the outreach committee for South Winnipeg Seniors Resource Council. And uh, usually we have Rod uh, here as moderator. Unfortunately, he couldn't come today. So we will muddle along ourselves. And um, we're really fortunate today to have a great uh, talented speaker, uh, Murray Peterson, who's a heritage officer and city historian. Uh, he has been researching and authoring reports for the city of Winnipeg on its heritage buildings for over 30 years. Uh, he's an author of several books on Winnipeg and Manitoba's history. Uh, I noticed one of them is uh, Winnipeg Landmarks, so I'm actually going to look forward to uh, taking a look at that in the near future. So he is proud to be supporting a number of initiatives uh, to bring Indigenous history to the forefront of Winnipeg's story. And so um, we're very happy to, to have you here today and I appreciate you coming out to share your knowledge, Murray. So I will pass it along to him. My name is Murray Peterson and I'm the City of Winnipeg's Heritage Officer, as you know. Um, today we're going to be talking about Roostertown, which is a Métis community in South Winnipeg that for many decades uh, was unknown and, had a, and was a very sad part of the city's history. Um, like so many other aspects of Winnipeg, though, like the news about the redevelopment of the Bay Building, um, Winnipeg's Indigenous voice is getting louder and we're actually starting to listen. So um, we're going to talk today a little bit about Roostertown. Um, I don't have a, a ton of slides. Sometimes I ramble on a little bit, but I'm sure there's going to be enough time at the end for questions. So uh, off we go. Um, I would like to first uh, acknowledge that we are talking today on the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people. I'm honored to acknowledge that all First Peoples who live in, inhabit, and occupy these lands and continue to contribute to Canada. We're also on the traditional land of the Métis Nation, the children of the fur trade, who were instrumental in gaining improved rights for all Manitobans when it entered con Confederation. And this is a, a painting done by my friend Jackie. It's beautiful. <laughs> So today what we're going to do, I'm just going to give you a quick outline here. We're going to, um, we're going to do a quick history of how Rooster Town came about, about who lived there and what it was like in Rooster Town and why it disappeared. Um, we have stories of the people that lived there. We have stories of the, the generations that came after them. And from that, we pieced together what it was like to live in Rooster Town. It's a story about a neighborhood. It's a story about family, about urbanization about racism and about reconciliation. The land along uh, Winnipeg's two rivers, even before it was ceded to the Dominion government by treaty number one by the local indigenous bands, was surveyed into long two mile strips of land called river lots. This uh, system of land ownership had the advantages of river access for all landowners. And it also meant that your neighbors were closer by in case you needed a cup of sugar or some flour. Much of this land was originally occupied by Métis family, who were very successful farmers, following in the Indigenous traditions of the area. As the modern city of Winnipeg expanded, much of this land was purchased and subdivided, and many of the Métis families were forced to move off their land. Many Métis urban settlements were founded on the outskirts of towns and cities in Western Canada in the early 1900s, often called road allowance settlements, because they were settled along rural roads. Often locating close to available work, these communities, like many other neighborhoods, developed social and kinship ties that stretched across many generations. But as urban centers began to grow, these fringe settlements were also often forced to relocate. For example, in the fall of 1938, the people of saint madeleine south of Binsgarth, Manitoba, returned from a hunting trip to find their 35 homes, their school, and their store burnt to the ground to make room for a community cattle pasture. Um, you can see their exhibit at the Manitoba Museum. It's, it's incredible. And, and they have stories from the original uh, people that lived in San Medellin. This forced movement and the final dismantling of these neighborhoods for modern development occurred in major centers and rural settings across Canada throughout the 1960s with devastating results. The map you see here is what would become is what would become the Grant Park area of Winnipeg. 
The Big Red Star is the new Helen and Bill Norrie Library at Grant and Cambridge. As you can see, Métis families began settling the area in the late 1890s, early 1900s, and for the next six decades moved their homes further and further south as the residential development of River Heights expanded south. So what's in a name? No one is quite sure where the name Roostertown actually came from. According to some, the name was derived from the fact that residents owned chickens, which I think the city of Winnipeg is going to allow us all to do again. Others claimed it was the fact that residents, uh, others claimed that it referred to the many seasonal railway workers that roosted in the community at different times of the year. Some newspapers falsely claimed that it originated from illegal cockfights being held in the community. What we do know and what we know is true is that Roostertown is the name that was given to the community by the by outsiders. It wasn't the name that the community called itself. The residents themselves called it Paquin Town, which referred to Bagan, which is an Ashinabi word for hazelnut bushes that grew wild in the area. So it's interesting that we, we, we learned that they're going to rename a park uh, Roostertown. Uh, might have been more appropriate to call it Paquin Town or Paquin Park, but there you have it. <laughs> Reconciliation is slow. <laughs> so the community of Pacantown or Roostertown grew to over 250 people by the 1940s. Its residents lived on unserviced lots, even though many of them paid taxes to the city of Winnipeg. Over three generations, the residents of Roostertown worked, raised family, painstakingly improved their lives, and preserved their culture and traditions, supporting one another in the community. The population fluctuated as families moved in and away. The house pictured on this slide is, is actually one that was an original uh, Roostertown house and it's still standing on Lorette Avenue. Now, like any neighborhood, there was poverty and the lack of city services all often exacerbated these problems. In the center of this slide, uh, you see the water cart belonging to Roostertown resident Frank Sayas, who's a friend of mine. Uh, which he used to deliver water in the community homes as a teenager in the 1950s. It was pumped from a local standpipe and he would haul the water year round for 80 cents a barrel. <laughs> he said it was pretty hard work. It wasn't really worth 80 cents a barrel, that's for sure. So we have a long standing neighborhood in the outskirts of Winnipeg that is generally ignored and unknown. Uh, now the question becomes, well, what happened to it? In 1951, the city began encouraging suburban de development in the, air, in the Grant Park area. To support the push to remove Roostertown families, the city, the city and local media reported false stories that were often rooted in racist stereotypes. These, storm, these stories were harmful and humil humiliating to the community. The terms squalor and squatters were used extensively. Stories of neighborhood children not wanting to play with Roostertown children were circulated as were unsubstantiated reports of drunkenness and widespread criminal activity. In 1960, the last few houses were bulldozed and the community was destroyed. Often the evicted families were given a small amount of cash to relocate. In one case, a family went to the civic offices to pay their taxes only to be informed that they no longer owned the property. Due to the pressure from the city to relocate, many Roostertown residents moved to Winnipeg's North End where houses were more affordable. Many families were heartbroken at the loss of their Roostertown homes. Most lost social support networks, as well as the strength and sense of community that came from living with other Métis families. Some lost employment opportunities with nearby businesses, all lost access to low cost housing. For the Sayas family, it took almost 40 years and two generations to own property again and they suffered in silence. The announcement of a new library located on Grand Avenue at Cambridge Street signaled a new beginning. Staff reached out and began the conversation to recognize that Roostertown existed, that the treatment of its citizens were unfair and that with the family's help, their stories could be told. I was asked as a city's historian to participate in meeting with the former residents, to listen to their stories and to find a way to share with them, share those stories in the new facility. After many months of work, we were able to create a unique interpretive installation at the library, which includes panels on bookcase ends and large posters. 
This installation was designed with, ro with room available for displaying more stories and panels. The Cities Indigenous Relations Division and library staff have accepted the responsibility of listening, saving, and sharing the visitors' stories. I just want to I just want to quickly mention. Um, obviously, this is a difficult topic, and um, it took uh, a lot of work from the library staff and from myself and, and other um, and Indigenous Relations Division to come up with the right kind of um, voice. Um, for these panels. Uh, we, as the writer, we hummed and hawed over how to, how to properly show and explain what happened. And, and we used the term Indian and we used the term racist and uh, we used a lot of hard words in the panels. And um, we asked the library department, we asked the many civic departments, we asked the mayor's office, um, if, if this was if this was appropriate and we argue that it was appropriate because it was the terms used by the citizens by the citizens of Rooster Town and that this was their story and we were going to tell their story and and to their great credit uh, everybody within the city of Winnipeg uh, embraced this project and uh, said you know if, if, if this is their story then they get to tell it so we uh, we told a very difficult story uh, using very hard words and um, the, the project is better for it. So that I just wanted to, to quickly digress there a little bit. Um, so when you go to the library, maybe the most unique element is outside. It's the exterior metal wall um, that displays the icons of Rooster Town. And we talked to hundreds of citizens from Rooster Town and uh, the icons, the four that we came up with were poems, uh, the pecan bushes, uh, family ties, the water cart, and a kitchen and a kettle. Um, the kettle becomes a very important icon because it, it sort of signifies family and sharing and um, the stories that we got from citizens over and over again were um, the door was always open, there was always room at the kitchen table, and there was always a cup of tea for them. Uh, and that, that included uh, strangers that were just walking along the right of way on the railroad tracks, uh, there'd be a, I mean, we, we heard more than more than one story of knocks on the door at night and uh, opening the door and offering a cup of tea to whoever was at the door. So it was um, it was important to recognize that, especially in light of all of the the stories that were told prior to. Uh, this is the Sayas family. So. Um, because it took so long, uh, because COVID interrupted and so many things happened, we, at the beginning of this project, at the beginning of the, the planning of the library, we had dozens of families. By the end of it, we didn't have dozens of families because they, you know, they we'd ask them to tell their story, we'd ask them to uh, trust us, and then things kind of stopped because of COVID and because of, you know, construction and things. So uh, a lot of the families just, just didn't have trust of the city of Winnipeg for obvious reasons. So uh, the Sayas family uh, stuck it out. And uh, so this was the, the part of their family and they all have ties to Rooster Town. Uh, the, the three eldest uh, grew up in Rooster Town and um, the gentleman on the far right standing in the short sleeve shirt uh, is my good friend, Darren Sayas and he works for the city of Winnipeg. And uh, he and I, um, have sort of worked to make sure that the, the family histories are, are continued. So at the end of the day, all of the panels went through the Sayas family um, to, to be vetted. Uh, we weren't going to put a single thing up unless they were approved. So the Sayas family and a couple other families were, uh, were gracious enough to tell their stories uh, because they're hard stories. Uh, this is the Beaumont Transit bus station and it also celebrates Rooster Town. If we've got a five meter kettle uh, which is spectacular, just out in the field there, and then some interpretive panels, which we've actually had to go back and repair. So, um, you know, this is an ongoing thing. That's why we designed the, the library panel uh, to be updated and to be, uh, to add more stories, because we, we believe that that's once, the, the hope is that once more of the citizens uh, have more trust in the city of Winnipeg, they'll start to tell their stories and they're important stories we want, you know, it's not a history of Winnipeg if you don't include the history of Rooster Town. So. 
And this is, uh, this is Evelyn Peters' book, uh, Rooster Town. Um, it's a fascinating book. Uh, she, she got access to everybody that is, that is connected to Rooster Town, everybody that they could find. Um, she and Matthew and, and Adrian worked uh, really hard on this book. There's lots of statistics, maps, uh, lots of pictures. Uh, a lot of them you're gonna see. We got permission from Evelyn and the families to, um, to put them in our panels. So you're, you'll see them on the panels, uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful book, um, very well written, uh, lots of stories, um, lots of statistics, uh, population uh, growth and numbers and stuff. So it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent, if, if you really wanna find out more about Rooster Town, this would be the book. Um, there are articles as well. There's lots of stuff online. I think the U of M has some stuff online as well, but uh, that's the book for sure. And that's it. That's all I got. All right. Wow. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Uh, you'll probably have to unmute yourselves and I can't see everybody on one screen. Debbie, I don't know if you can help that. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll keep shifting over. So. Okay, so anybody who has a question, just uh, unmute yourself and chime in. Hi, Murray. This is Merle who uh, cornered you to do this presentation. I appreciate your efforts. Um, interestingly, I did not and had not heard about Rooster Town did not realize that uh, people were living on the prairie um, when I grew up on Niagara Street. From the time I was nine I, until I went into nursing training, I lived just south of Corridon and uh, Corridon wasn't even paved at that point. But believe it or not, I did not have the inkling that there was a whole community out there. Oh. And it's interesting because my mother used to take us out on the prairie to do, do hot dogs with a little campfire. Uh, that was a big treat, but we, she never made us aware of people living out there. I don't know if she did or not, but uh, certainly we're aware of the um, residential school on Academy uh, but not Rooster Town. And uh, so I was very interested when this uh, information came forward uh, to find out about it. My brother, who's seven years younger, he seemed to know more about a little bit about it because he went to Grant Park High School. But it's totally amazing how having lived there all that time, I never was aware. So I appreciate uh, your information. Thanks, and thanks for connecting with me. I, I love doing these things. It's kind of my my favorite thing. Uh, yeah, you know, we, as I said, you know, it, it's a really important part of our history. You know, every, everything is an important part of our history, right? And that's my job to try and tell the you know a full story. Um, certainly, I've done a lot of work at a Cinnabon residential school on Academy Road, and a lot of those neighbors expressed the same shock that there they didn't even know there was one uh, residential school. So, it's um, yeah, you know, it's. I, I think the, the problem, you know, I, I, I reread my, uh, my show today and, and I realized that I hadn't put about the silence of the citizens and that it's, it's very difficult, very much like the residential school survivors. They have a story to tell, but they, they are, they're afraid to tell it for a lot of reasons, um, you know, because it, it's hard. It's hard to talk about this stuff, you know, and, and um, I, I appreciate that these stories are difficult and I, I, I appreciate that, that people can can make it through and listen to them because they're 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 hard you know it, racism is a tough word and it's um, you know the 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 length that the city of Winnipeg and the developers and the uh, the media went to to get rid of Rooster Town and the lies they told were were pretty shocking. Um, there's a lot more if, if if you visit the library there's a there's a whole panel just just talking about what the media said and it's 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 really hard reading um you know, talking about the kids didn't want to play with the other kids because they were dirty and uh, and just just flat out lies in the newspaper so it's 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 a tough 
it's, it's a very tough part of history, but you know what? It's, it's really important to tell it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that the, the family trusted me to, to work on it. So, you know, any time that I can speak about it is, is, is a really wonderful thing for sure. So thank you for hunting me down, Merle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Sharon, go ahead. And we thought fake news was something new, eh? <laughs> <laughs> When we first signed up for this presentation, we went online and looked at some of the maps and other things that we could find. And I noticed that, that where Grant Avenue is now, there was a train track down there, right? Yeah, further, further south, there was a, oh, no, you're right. No, I'm sorry, there was, yep. Yeah, yeah there, there was, the Grant Avenue was a, was a train line. Yep, you bet. Yeah, I was surprised to see that. Yeah. Oh, they were, they were crisscrossing all, all through, you know, all yeah. through Winnipeg for sure. And so Rooster Town was mostly in between those two tracks. Yeah, and that, and that was, I mean, that was another sort of the falsehood that the that the community would go and and, and raid the railway right of ways and, and take take wood off of the boxcars. Now, you know, we, we we didn't talk to all the citizens, right? And and you know, the ones from the you know are obviously lots of them are long since passed. But you know, and any any families in the neighborhood said that that's just not. That's not how they got their materials. And yes, absolutely, there were shacks. You bet. Um, you know, there were there were some pretty pretty rough areas. I guess what what their real concern was was that that was the only story being told. So the free press would show pictures of of you know a mom and three kids. You know, obviously in 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 some stage of poverty, but wouldn't show the picture of the nice house with the number on the side, mm. and the, the one that was owned by the by the property owner, right? You, you only got one side of that story. And then, and then in the middle, yep, just sorry, one more sec. And then in the, in the middle of all of this sort of um, rebirth of the story of Rooster Town, the Free Press did a, did a, a lengthy article, talked to lots of people, mm -hmm. and in the end showed the same pictures of the, of the poverty and didn't show any of the, again, didn't show the building with the numbers on it. It was, it did more. It did more damage than than the than the free press could ever imagine. Because then the 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 people just said, "Well, we're not. Obviously, you still can't be trusted. Non non rooster non Métis people still can't be trusted." Um, so that was that was really problematic. That 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 really set us back. So it was it was hard to. To convince them afterwards, even even showing them what we had done with the city, done with the Cinnamon Residential School, um, we still a lot of them just don't trust us. So that's and that's sorry about that. <laughs> Somebody really wants to talk to me, and I'm not going to talk to them. <laughs> Joanne, you had a question. Yeah, actually, I was wondering what was the population of the town? Um, you know, either number of families or or you know total population. Um, yeah. It certainly varied. It started at about like at the turn of the century. I think there was 25 families, and it 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 moved around a lot. It was 250, 300 people at, at the at its peak. And okay. uh, we, uh, Evelyn Peters, the author, got um, got everybody to sort of do a, a family history uh, or a, a family tree to sort of connect to see who actually you know what generations, how many people sort of have Rooster Town in their background, and it. When she finished it, it was, I think it was six or seven meters long. It, it's just, it's spectacular. And it's, uh, I, I think she's got part of it in her book or all of it in her book, but it's, um, it, it made you realize that even, you know, even if they stayed for a couple of years and then moved on, they found a better job or they did, you know, whatever, which is, you know, there's certainly a, a level of transient nature to the, to the, to the town. Uh, it was still connected, right? You still had family back there. You still had, you know, longtime family friends, and so I, I think that was one of the things that we we recognized once the research got happening was that, yeah, this was it was just a neighborhood like any other neighborhood, Fort Rouge or St. James, or you know, it just it just was never painted that way, and the, mm -hmm. that was what really hurt the citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I was wondering, was there electricity and plumbing in the area? And did the children go to the public schools? Uh, no electricity, no plumbing. Uh, they, they uh, no snow plowing. Um, but they did go to the local schools. Yeah, um, we tried to get, um, we tried to get some uh, class pictures. I thought, I thought I, I thought I had a really good idea. So I went to the local school and asked for uh, pictures, and they. 
they didn't have them going back as far as the wow. as we needed to go, which was really too bad because that's Ooh. one of the one of the really big things was that apparently a nurse, a city nurse, wrote wrote a report on how bad the the um, how bad things were in Rooster Town as they were starting to crank up to try and evict them, mm. and we you know. I've got good friends at the city archives and we could not find any report. We couldn't even find a mention of the report. And the, the newspapers reported it, that this, this nurse went and talked to people and wrote this long report. And while wow, we've got, you know, for their good, we have to get rid of, we have to evict them because they're, you know, they're not healthy in rooster town. Um, and we can't find, we can't find anything on that report. So finding something, you know, the, the reports that was where the, that was quoted as saying that the, the school kids wouldn't play with the rooster or wouldn't touch or play with the rooster oh, yeah. which was just not true but we couldn't find it thought boy if we find a class picture that would be great and and we did we couldn't mm -hmm. find one of those either so that's too bad okay yeah. so what's the name of that school oh uh was it rockwood i think it was rockwood yep okay brian yeah. here went to rockwood right around that time in the Near the end of Rooster Town. And? Does he and, have any, any stories? <laughs> Not really. He was aware of, of it, but he doesn't remember, you know, any particular children in the school. None that he had to stay away from, right? No. No. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Hey, Joanne, you were next. Yeah, actually, um, what was around Rooster Town? Like, were there other neighborhoods? Uh, you know, why was this targeted? You know, I'm kind of wondering about the whole, you know, the global picture of what was going on in Winnipeg at that time. Why was Grand Park picked to go there? You know, like, do you do you have any idea about that? It, it was just it was sort of the national uh, natural progression of of like just sort of moving further and further south. Okay. Rooster Town. Rooster Town was was really a railroad a railroad town, right? Mm -hmm. So like the the uh, they got work on the they got work on the trains and they so it was it was an easy way you know it, it was an easy way to walk like to get to a, a job uh, you could walk it right away. So uh, you know much like the much like Saint Madeleine or anywhere across Western Canada, you you sort of located along a transportation line so that you could you could get to a job right because they didn't have cars and they wouldn't have had horses mm -hmm. so so for most of them it was it was logical it did not not a lot different than the north end where they all they all developed their residential right beside the cpr yards right because because yeah. that's where the work was so these these communities sort of located close to railways so that was and then as it pushed um, one of the things that really started the, the end of Brewster Town was was Grand Park High School, because because the school division wanted the land, but they didn't want the riffraff. So that that kind of I I think I recall that the deal was we'll put we'll, we'll build a school here, but it's going to have to be on empty land, and so that that led to evictions. Mm -hmm. Renee has a question. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Um, Murray, what language did they speak? Was it Michif or French or English or? Uh, all of it. Um, I've heard uh, I've heard family members bashing away in Michif and uh, and and English and French. Uh, you know, most most of their most of their interactions outside of the community were English, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, there would have been you know most mostly English, but yeah, they. Uh, they spoke Michif, they uh, played okay. fiddles. <laughs> Interesting. It, it, was just a real, it, it was just a, a, a Métis community. And, and I guess that's the thing, I guess I'm, I'm trying to make everyone understand it's just a normal community. It was Métis, it had families, it had neighbors, it had dogs, it had chickens, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't have any services. And then when it came time for them to go, it was handed in a, it was handled in a very, uh, heavy-handed way. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the um, hazelnuts. Can you just um, spell the words that you said for the park? What, what were you asking, sorry? Oh, the hazelnuts. Oh, that you, you know, pardon? Paquin. Uh, so it's P -A -C. P -A -C. So th that's a terrific question because, I, again, people in the neighborhood 
it's a great story and I promise I'll get to your answer, but um, I talked to the to residents for about a year and a half and finally I was sitting having a coffee with one of them and he said, well, you know, of course, we never called it Rooster Town. And it was like, like our panels were like well on their way to being done. And it was like, Frank, what did you just say? And then we all stopped and went, what? He goes, well, no, that's what everybody else called it. We called it back in town. And I was like, oh my goodness. So, uh, so, so then we had to go back and ask everybody and sure enough, yeah, no, we refer to it as Paquin Town. So P-A-C-A-N, Paquin. Okay. Kind of there and uh, um, were the, um, like hazelnuts, I mean, was it just um, uh, rough ground and were they used for anything or did it, was it just a place where hazelnuts happened to grow? That, that's that's correct. I, that's it. I, I didn't hear any stories of like using it for for cooking. I, I, I would yes. imagine they would, but it was, mm -hmm. um, they said that like along the right of way, you know, they, they would remove any any trees that weren't a lot, but there was bushes that ran along the railway right away. And those were, those were, back Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I have one more question. Um, the picture of the woman leaning against her house, um, had she, the house was taken from her or? Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific question, Jane. Um, that, that, so that, wasn't in Pecan town that was that was uh elsewhere um mm -hmm. we had it, it's always funny when you write panels and people point out the most difficult ones almost every time and that one was a that one was a very difficult choice to make um you know it's it's in a panel at the at the, at the library at the nori library um and it's not Pecan town but but we know that uh people were um were kicked out, uh, you know, with 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 pot, you know, with kettles on the boil. Um, they were they were literally removed, and the bulldozers came in. We we know that that's that's true. Um, we wanted, while it's while it's not in Pecan Town, we wanted to recognize um, the hurt involved in in being removed from your from your house and your family and your friends. And right. It, so it, it's a we debated it we talked to we talked to lots of family members and they said well okay we we did we couldn't afford a camera but we saw we witnessed that so so we decided that we would we would yeah. i i probably wouldn't have used it but it's because it's a you know a picture's worth more than a thousand words and that picture's worth a million words we we felt that it was acceptable to use it even though you just to portray the feelings because that again i, I any time we talk to Rooster Town folk, they wanted us to remember how how loved they were and how comfortable they were, e even though it wasn't the, the comfortableness of sort of suburban Winnipeg in the 1950s. They were comfortable. They were happy. They had community. And then when you take that away and you you lie to take it away, it it was it the hurt is unbearable. So we 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 thought we needed to show that. So terrific mm -hmm. question. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so can I have a um, something, a question related to that? Do the people actually own the land? They're paying taxes. They did they have title to the land? Did they buy it? Uh, absolutely. They we have, we, so, we have so how did title. how did they get rid of them then? They just if they, they took just, it away. They just they just took it away. That that we we looked into that because that was one of the the first thing that we were told. The archives was that. No, I own my land. Like I paid, I paid taxes, and we went back and found assessment rolls, and they did. Like the the Sayas family was one of the families that owned property in there, and then they just they just took it. We're not, you know, again, we don't have the documentation for it, but we we know that that they were they were told that they no longer owned the land. Now, I, I guess I guess the city might have power to evict, um, but you know, it was that was a. That was a pretty shocking story. There weren't, uh, no, I'm not, I, no, don't get me wrong. There weren't a lot of people that owned property in Rooster Town, but that was how they had lived for, you know, 50 years. So they were, they were fine with it because, you know, for a lot of them, they were, it, there was a lot of transient nature, seasonal work. So, you know, a lot of times they would come and go. Um, so they were that there, that setup, that form of habitation was perfect for their lifestyle, but, 
wasn't perfect for her development. So we don't we don't have any documentation. We do have letters from city departments saying, okay, we got to get rid of these people. And here's how much how much do you think we can give them to get rid of them? And uh, like like compensation checks and that well that you know we do have a couple of letters saying well this person isn't accepting the check so we're gonna have to give it to them and they're we're just gonna have to get them off. So we do we do have documentation of that. The, the, the taking of old land, we, we, we don't know how that, I, I guess there's a way you can do it. I don't know. That's a terrific question. Thank you. And then uh, even, even nowadays, if the city wants your land, they send you a letter and anyone uh, else? you're whistling in the wind. They've got the power to do that even today. Yeah. Hmm. I might jump in with a question, uh, Murray. But first of all, thank you very much for your, your talk and thank you to the Senior Maybe. Center for arranging it. I, I'm really delighted that I found out about it and I'm able to uh, listen in this afternoon. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago the role of the city archives in, in the research that you've done. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit upon that. Uh, you have already to some extent, but, but people often don't know about the important work of the city archives or even that the city archives exist. And it's really important, I think, for people in Winnipeg to understand that and to see, of course, the, the fruits of all of that in the work that you've done. Uh, wow, that's that's a terrific question. Um, my friends at the archives are going to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's um, when we when we lost the, the archives to the rain, when the, the William Library, the, Arch, the um, Carnegie Library was uh, was sort of damaged and they moved the archives. It was, um, for me, I, I've been researching City of Winnipeg history since 1987, and I've used the archives since the very beginning. In fact, at the very beginning, I was kind of the archivist because there, was, there wasn't a lot going on there. Um, there the crew they have in there now is, is world-class. They're, they're terrific. Uh, you've got a question, they'll, they'll hunt down an answer. They've got <clears throat> assessment rules for the city of Winnipeg going back to 1871, right from the very beginning. Uh, they've got assessment rules for most of the municipalities. Uh, they've got original building permits for the city of Winnipeg starting in 1899. Um, and then all of the, you know, they've got a lot of the mayor's uh, co personal correspondence going back to the beginning, uh, you know, all sorts of reports and maps. And uh, it's, it's a marvelous, marvelous treasure. We're, we're really crossing our fingers that, um, you know, as we move forward, finding them a new venue that, uh, that we can make it more of a, a modern archives, meaning, uh, you know, we, they can do programming, they can have, uh, you know, schools come in, uh, you know, we can get more access to information um, safely, uh, you know, uh, fire retardant systems, all that, um, you know, there's a moving glacially, there is a plan to, uh, to, to get a new archives building. We're not sure what that's going to look like, but um, it's really important. The archives is a, a one, a, you know, it, it's really important. It, it holds so much of the city's information. And for, in, for a project like this, you know, we, they dug and dug and dug and then found all of this, you know, all these letters and all of this, you know, the, found the actual assessment roll document saying that this Sayas family owned this property and the legal. And so, you know, in, in, in times when nothing is written down in paper, it used to all be written down in paper. And so it's really important to keep that and to, you know, to digitalize it and make sure that it's searchable. So thank you. Yeah, that's it. It was, it was crucial in, in finding out a lot of the information because you, you have to, you know, again, when you're working with people's memories, you have to make sure that they're true, right? So when, when Frank Sayas said that he owned property, it was like, ooh, okay, well, let's see if we can prove that. We don't, we, it's not that we don't, don't trust you or don't believe you, but we're going to need to find some proof, right? So that we can put them on the panels and sure enough, there was. So, you know, that becomes a really important part of the story because it's, people go, well, well, like the question we got, right? Well, how can they do, the city can't do that. Well, they, they can actually. And they and they worked really hard to to get uh, you know uh, public public support on their side. So thanks, Tom. That was a great question. Did I answer is that good? Oh, that was wonderful. I couldn't agree more with you. Of course, I've worked in archives all my life, and um, uh, just to underscore a point. 
anyone can use the city archives. If people are interested in following up on the Rooster Town story, you can go to the city archives yourself and see those records and examine them or other records for any other topic that uh, yeah. you're interested in. Yeah, and the, the library has something called Past Forward, which is great. You can search a whole bunch of stuff. City Archives was donated uh, oh, thousands of postcards. So you can go in and search their postcards and, and it's fascinating because of course that's, you know, a slice of life. You get, you know, little Johnny in front of the city hall and then you get, you know, the big buildings and the big fires. And so postcards are a wonderful heritage record and, uh, and you can see those. Yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff out there for sure. Thanks, Marie. Yep. Yeah. So, so where is the archives now? Like, <laughs> it's it's on Myrtle Street. Um, so you know where Christie Biscuits Building is on Notre Dame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's Myrtle. The cross street there is Myrtle, and oh. and they're in a little, a little, sad little one story sort of mixed use warehouse that they've they've filled to the rafters in the back, and then they have a they have a research table at the front, and you can go in. It's if you if you want to do some research, um, it, I would I would suggest that you go online and email them uh, to make an appointment. Um, just because it's easier, they'll they'll bring the. I, I always laugh because I, I say, you know, I'm not I'm not a party I'm not a party uh, toy, right? Like I I don't know all the answers because I'm a researcher, which means I research. I don't remember. I'm not called a rememberer because ask my kids, I don't remember anything. But I'm a researcher, so and they are too, right? So if you're looking for something specific on a building or a house or something, um, email ahead and they'll they'll dig around and they'll find stuff and then and then they produce for you. So that's a, that's always mm -hmm. a, that's always a it's always a good way to to um, to access archival records for sure. Yeah, I I had another question. So how and I may have missed it at the beginning. So how was it decided to tell the story in the new library? Like, well, <laughs> I mean, that's that, one that, that, that too was a bit of I no, I didn't. Uh, it's it's a bit of a I had to decide how many sad stories I was going to tell. Um, and so I left this one out. Um, when it was decided that they were going to they needed a new library and, and um, they were going to locate it where they were going to locate it, um, somebody contacted the library and said, You know, that's right smack dab in the middle of Rooster Town, to which everybody in the city went, what's that, right? Because it's just, uh, because quite frankly, that's exactly the reaction that, that was deserved at the time. Mm -hmm. So they got, they got uh, designers, they got a lot of people excited and a lot of people involved and then dropped the ball a little bit in the naming because because really um, the, the plan was to have um, concrete, uh, benches out front with the name Rooster Town on it. There was, there was a lot of plans that got involved and then they got canceled just because of budget and because of COVID and because of a lot of things. Um, so when the name came out, and, and don't get me wrong, uh, I, I actually worked for Mayor Nori and I, I go back that far at the city of Winnipeg. Fabulous man, wonderful couple, all that. Um, probably as part of the reconciliation process, probably should have named it Rooster Town Library. Mm -hmm. Didn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that caused some problems with the community. They they stepped back and said, ah, you know, I thought I thought this was going to be uh, this was going to be a real remembrance. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a problem. Um, at, at, but the the flip side of the coin was um, libraries realized, oh, okay, yep, yeah, yep, we understand. We we acknowledge that we might have slipped up there, and then that gave them that gave us carte blanche to to tell whatever story we wanted. We never once got anything but support from libraries branch. They all wanted to know how they could help. They all wanted to make sure they that we understood that they were going to be, you know, they were going to take stories when they came in because they're getting tons of visitors and tons of people saying, oh, I came from Rooster Town. Well, would you like to come in and tell your story? Well, no, but you know, here, like, here's a cup of tea. Would you like, you know, can, is there anything that you would like to share with us? Um, we don't right now have room for artifacts, but we've made that ask to the community as well. So who knows? You know, 20 years down the road, maybe we'll have a one of the fiddles from the from the kitchen party mm -hmm. uh, that we know happened. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was um, that was that was a bit of a whoops. But beyond the naming, I, I like I've been to a I've been to a big public event, a big um, AT celebration in the in the park in the yeah in the in the the playing field behind the the library, and they're just they 
they're so happy. I got I got a lot of hugs that day. It was great. I took I took one of my grandsons and he danced and we danced and it was really fun. And they I, I think they need some time. Right? Just just like the residential school people, they need they need time and they need to trust you to tell you their real stories. And once we get there, then then Winnipeg's history is is better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any more questions? Okay. Anything else you want to add, Murray? That was fascinating. Really wonderful. Yeah. Um, no, just thank you very much for listening. I know this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I started seven years ago not knowing anything, I mean, uh, not knowing anything about Winnipeg's Indigenous history, nothing, zero, and I was the city's historian. Um, it, I've, I've come a long way. I think Winnipeg's come a long way. I, 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 I acknowledge that you're here uh, listening to this because it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful testament to, to Winnipeggers and the fact that they, they don't mind learning. Um, but this is hard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like the fact that anytime on the national news, they talk about this, they say there's a 1-800 number. Um, you know, I've, <laughs> I've used, I've, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of uh, elder friends now, uh, elders that are friends um, that I reach out to because this is, it's, it's hard stuff. It, it's, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll be sitting, sitting in the living room and, and, and it'll just hit me how, how difficult these lives were for these people. Um, so, so please take care of yourselves um, and, and learn. There's lots, there's, there's lots of stuff out there on Rooster Town. There'll be lots more. Keep, uh, Keep your uh, keep your nose to the grindstone because, uh, of course, with the magic of internet, uh, more stories will come out. Um, the the Saint Madeleine uh, exhibition at uh, Manitoba Museum is wonderful. You should go and check that out. Please go to the library. It's uh, I'm I'm very proud of it. It's uh, it's it's not my work, but I, I'm very proud to have, have been a part of it. So uh, yeah, thank you mm -hmm. very much. I'm, uh, I, I'm, deeply honored to have done this today thank you well thank you thank, thank you very much